Thank you, Jeff, for that introduction. Um, we were fortunate that enough this past summer to have two really great undergrads, Kendra and Nikhil, um, with us in the lab. Um, and so they were, they did an amazing job, really, of getting a lot done in a short period working on this. Um, so I'm going to first talk about the motivation. So a couple motivating factors that influenced this research that we did. Um, I'm going to go over some related work. Uh, then we'll get into the fun stuff with the experiment design and the implementation, how we did stuff, and then we'll go over some results at the end. Um, so this work was largely motivated by two common limitations in current AR head-worn displays. So the first of these is that the augmented field of view isn't really the same as the user's normal physical field of view. And in fact, it's generally much smaller. Um, And while typical AR devices can provide visual and audio stimuli, additional sensory channels, they have the potential to be pretty powerful. Um, so in particular, we were interested in expanding the sensory stimulation to include some form of haptic feedback in addition to the visual and audio. And for both of these things, we're particularly interested in the, their effects on a user's sense of co-presence in AR. Um, so what do we mean by co-presence in AR? Uh, the term presence has been around for a while in virtual reality, and it may have lots of you know, nuances, different meanings for different people, but historically, um, it's been thought of as referring to this one sense of being there in a virtual environment, so you feel like you're present. Um, in AR, the concept of co-presence might be described instead as how one perceives the sense of being there, uh, sorry, the sense of being together with virtual entities that are in that uh, augmented or mixed reality environment. Um, and Slater introduced a related concept um, of plausibility illusions. I, originally it's a VR concept, but it seems potentially relevant to AR entities, um, in particular with the plausibility of the interactions in sensory stimuli, or lack thereof, um, in AR interactions. And um, some of the, the plausibility stuff will make sense when I go over the rest of the experiment. Um, so looking at some related work related to field of view, Previous research has shown that restricting a user's peripheral view can have behavioral effects, so such as causing the users to move their head around more, um, and it can affect you know, navigation tasks, it can affect search tasks in VR, it can affect search tasks in AR, um, and it may be related to distance underestimation in VR. Um, some of our previous work has also showed that restricting the peripheral vision while wearing HoloLens, for example, can result in um, similar behavioral changes, so head motion, um, and some proxemic behavior, uh, in particular with uh, interactions with real and virtual humans. Um, unlike that work, this, current, this work that I'm presenting here um, doesn't involve virtual humans, it involves other entities, and it was a very different task, the AR search task. Um, historically, there have been you know, somewhat a lack of research looking at haptic feedback in AR and VR. Um, a lot of that's because of the complexities and limitations of the technology. That said, there has been work that's done, that's been done, and it's generally pretty promising, um, tying haptic feedback to, let's say, co-presence and task performance, um, as well as presence, social presence, more natural interaction behaviors. Uh, recent work has also shown positive effects of indirect haptic feedback um, in AR scenarios, so that is, rather than getting haptic sensations directly from a virtual entity, um, you instead get those sensations through a shared physical object um, so let's say, you know, a floor that you're standing on with a virtual entity um, or a table that you share with a virtual entity. Um, so this is a concept that we'll use again uh, in this work. So let's get into the details about the experiment itself. Um, we had uh, 22 total participants. It was a within subject design, uh, 13 male, 9 uh, female, ages 18 to 41. Um, and each participant spent around an hour uh, doing, going through all the conditions. The task itself was a search task. It involved a physical set of shelves and cardboard boxes. The boxes then were augmented with virtual labels, um, and they could be opened virtually. So the experiment starts with a virtual human, in this case Barbara, um, asking the participant for help. She's lost her cat in one of these boxes, and she needs the participant's help in finding that cat. Um, she briefly explains how to open the boxes using the clicker for the HoloLens. Um, and then, of course, the search task was to find the cat in those boxes before time uh, timer ran out. So they had one minute to complete the search task. Um, in those boxes, there's one of these five things, either the cat they're trying to find, or one of these four uh, less pleasant critters that may uh, leap out and fly out at them. Um, so I have a 
a short video here so you can see this is app of introduction um, showing the user opening the boxes and various critters that would fly out or leap out at them while they're opening them. Um, you'll see if they go and open a box that they've already opened, it just remains empty because they've already searched there. Whatever was in there has already come out. Um, and you'll notice that the critters very quickly move towards the, the participants. And in the end, this, this person was able to successfully find the cat and say, hooray for them. Um, so as part of this physical setup, we have a way of introducing haptic feedback for the user. Um, we do this through a transducer that's attached to a rigid platform on which the participant would stand. Um, in our particular setup, we use uh, a butt kicker transducer. Um, and if you recall how the critters would jump towards the participant uh, from, from the boxes, um, the way that the, the vibrotactile feedback was designed so that it would mimic the sense of the critter hitting the floor at their feet and then scurrying across the floor. So um, it, uh, it, it felt very convincing. <laughs> um, and as you may have noticed in the video, uh, the critters jump quite fast towards the participant, meaning that they very quickly disappear below the visual field of view. Um, in this setup, the vibrotactile platform is actually making up for some of that visual, the lack of visual stimuli, right? Because you can feel the critter landing at your feet and moving even though it's moved out of the bottom of the augmented field of view visually. Um, so speaking about field of views, um, on the left here, you see a view from inside a HoloLens is the backside of a HoloLens, in this case, unobstructed. And of course, if you're wearing a HoloLens like this, you can pretty much see the entire physical setup there, the shelves, the platform, everything. Um, it's pretty clear. Uh, in contrast, we could restrict the field of view of the participant by um, masking around everything but the augmented field of view. Um, so in this sense, what their physical field of view was essentially equivalent as the augmented field of view. Um, and you can see what they would then see there on the right. Um, very limited, but everything in that field of view would be augmented. So we can achieve a similar effect by restricting, uh, instead of restricting the field of view, by de-emphasizing stuff in the peripheral content. So for example, by not having it illuminated. Um, so one of the things that we could vary in our experimental setup was the lighting. So one of the conditions involved only having the center of the area lit, so the, the main area where the shelves are in the boxes um, as part of the task. Uh, the rest of the, the periphery was darkened. In particular, you'll notice that the floor area, so around where the platform and their feet were, um, was quite dark, so you wouldn't expect to be able to see objects that were down there, similar to masking out um, the physical field of view. So in all, we had three independent variables that we could control, whether the participant experiences vibrotactile feedback, whether the participant's field of view is restricted, um, and whether the periphery, including the floor area, floor area by the participant's feet, is darkened. Um, and as we mentioned previously, we used a full factorial within subject design, so given those three independent variables, um, we have a total of eight experimental conditions. So um, here you can see on the top full lighting versus only that central lighting, um, in this case with the unrestricted field of view. On the bottom you see each of those with the restricted field of view. Um, and then finally all four of those we did with and without vibrotactile feedback. So for subjective measures, um, we adjusted some standard questionnaires that have been used in other previous work. Um, all four questionnaires were relatively short in the range of five to nine questions. Um, and all the questions were on a seven point scale, um, such that we could get a final average score for each particular subjective dimension on that uh, one to seven scale. Um, the four dimensions that we looked at were spatial presence, social presence, engagement, and then gaming experience. Um, we had a few hypotheses, hypotheses going into the experiment. Um, the first of these was that we expected the participants would have higher co-presence with the addition of the vibrotactile feedback. Um, the second hypothesis we had was that the central lighting condition, where the periphery was dark, would also produce higher co-presence. And similar to that, we expected that we would see higher co-presence when the augmented field of view was restricted to match the, uh, sorry, when the physical field of view was restricted to match the augmented field of view. Um, so let's talk about some of the interesting results that we saw. Um, I'm going to show you some of the results from the subjective questionnaires, but first let me quickly describe how everything is organized in the plots. Um, so on the y-axis, that's the specific dimension of the subjective questionnaire, so in this case the spatial presence questionnaire. 
um, and remember that it's on a scale from one to seven. Um, and then the data is divided by all the conditions. So you have central lighting, you have normal lighting, and then we further divide to unrestricted field of view, restricted field of view, and finally the conditions with no, no vibrotactile feedback and those that had haptic feedback on. Um, so with the vibrotactile feedback enabled, we indeed saw a significant effect in spatial presence dimension. Um, likewise, we saw a significant upward difference in social presence with the vibrotactile feedback turned on. Um, and also in conditions um, with haptic feedback enabled, we saw a significant increase in the engagement dimension. Um, so all three of those uh, were significant effects with vibrotactile feedback turned on. Um, for engagement, we also found that users reported significantly higher engagement in the central lighting condition um, as opposed to the full lighting condition. So when the periphery was not lit, um, this could have been related to the, the specific task we're doing and sort of the creepiness of the fact that there's these dark critters that are jumping out. So it may have seemed more realistic and more appropriate for this particular task. Um, there was some indication of that from some of the, the anecdotal responses that participants gave us. Um, and speaking of anecdotal responses, um, we also noted some interesting reactions. So we looked for a few specific avoidance behaviors during the trials. Um, so we saw that in some of the trials, participants would you know, pull their heads and torsos back, so they'd you know, move backwards as a critter was jumping out at them. Um, more people than that, we actually saw, move to the side to try to avoid these virtual critters that were coming out, so you know, moving one side to the other side. Um, and we looked for people that would you know, raise their hands to try and protect themselves. We didn't see anyone do it, um, at least not uh, during the, the particular trials for the study. Um, we saw it maybe in other cases, demoing to people, but... Um, so in, in we saw some uh, anecdotal comments from users uh, talking in particular about an increased sense of immersion um, when the, the lighting condition was dark in the periphery. So for example, uh, one user said that the darkness made the experience feel more immersive. Um, and another comment was that compared to the previous condition, having floor vibrations with lights off felt more immersive than having floor, floor vibrations with the lights on. Um, and in fact, we received multiple similar comments from participants that suggested that the effects of the vibrotactile feedback um, was actually stronger in the conditions with central lighting. Um, even though the vibrations themselves would have been the same across all the conditions, the, the central lighting actually enhanced the effect of having that vibrotactile feedback. Um, we also got several comments from participants that indicated a phenomenon that's sometimes referred to as attention funneling. Um, so this is where they were almost exclusively uh, paying attention to the augmented region in the field of view. And this could have been related to the specifics of this task because they were focused on searching those boxes that were directly in front of them. And generally they were facing um, where, where the augmented field of view would cover anyway. So reviewing their, our hypotheses. Um, in the end, we found support for our first hypothesis. Um, an important takeaway from this is really that adding vibrotactile feedback can be a really good, relatively easy way of potentially making the air ex experience you know, significantly more effective. Um, the second hypothesis, we didn't see really evidence of increased co-presence related to the central lighting condition, but we did see significant effect in engagement, um, as well as some you know, pretty interesting anecdotal feedback talking about the, the enhancement that this central lighting condition can have. Um, it's perhaps, it perhaps warrants some additional investigation or consideration, particularly depending on the specifics of your AR scenario or task. Uh, and we were actually surprised that we didn't see any support for our third hypothesis um, in contrast to uh, the lighting variation, so restricting the field of view to only be the augmented field of view. Um, this was interesting because you know previous work that we had done and seen suggested that we would see some different effects uh, by this. But again, this may have been related to the fact that there was this attention funneling going on and the search task was very limited to um, objects that were generally directly in front of the users. So, so to conclude, to go over things again, um, the viral tactile feedback can be a very powerful tool for AR, so consider kicking some butts um, or using whatever device you might want to use. Um, the controlled lighting also has potential for enhancing an AR experience, um, perhaps in combination with other factors. Um, one exciting aspect of this work is that it's related to, to, to technology that's 
um, really starting to expand a lot more now. So we're really excited to see uh, what the effects are of you know dramatically increasing the augmented field of view that AR devices have, and all sorts of you know great new haptic feedback devices that may come along with those. Um, so uh, the other photo that's on here is a demo that we set up of a very similar setup at uh, a large conference, uh, IATSEC, um, where attendees could actually experience the AR with vibrotactile feedback. Um, and we did get a lot of great uh, feedback and some, um, some early comments that helped guide what we did in the study, too. Um, it was a lot of fun. So thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of that, I guess, was related to the specifics of this task. There wasn't really a need for them to pay attention to a lot of the things in the periphery. Um, as you said, there wasn't anything dynamic there that they had to pay attention to. Um, it could be that if we repeated this experiment with something that was going on in the periphery, that we may see um, more significant differences, for example, for restricting the, the physical field of view to match the augmented field of view. Um, you know, you may see more of that head motion and behavioral things like that. So, yeah, that is a good point. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, in this particular study, there wasn't really any spatial audio. So there was audio, as you heard in the video, um, and the critters made different sounds, but it really wasn't spatially localized audio. It was either they heard it or they didn't hear it. Um, I don't know how, how good the audio spatialization would be on you know, a HoloLens device like that. Um, you could certainly repeat it with spatialized audio, especially if you had a maybe a slightly larger area where the critters kept making noise as they moved. Um, we didn't look at it in this case, but it could be a, a very interesting thing to look at. Any other questions? I'll thank the speaker again.